Happy Fab Friday, everyone. I am Haley Hoffman, founder and CEO of Dandy Day. And Dandy Day is a conscious beauty firm, and we are bridging ingredient companies doing good for people on planet and um, brands that have the reach to create that change one person at a time. And so we've created Fab Fridays as a place to inspire creativity and um, an innovation mindset. And so um, one of our one of our Fridays every month is focused on DEI, and that might be a new term to some of you, and to some of you maybe not. And so we're joined here by our DEI partner and expert, Dr. Justin Belton of Go Culture. And so thank you so much for joining us today, Justin. Dr. Hey. Justin. Yeah, thank you, Haley. It's great to be here. Yeah, so uh, I, I know you were already on as a guest before, just kind of going into the history of your company and how you came to be at this place right now. Um, and so we're really excited to just kind of dive in and understand a little bit more about this topic of DEI. So um, could you start off on just telling the, telling the audience what, what DEI is, what it, what it means, what it is, what it stands for? Sure. Hey, again, thanks for having me. You know, it's uh, you must be uh, a glutton for punishment to have me on more than one time. So uh, we, I appreciate that. We all are. <laughs> so, yeah, DEI is really just an acronym for a much bigger idea, which is this idea of diversity, equity and inclusion. And so th those terms kind of have taken on their own life form. Uh, some people will argue for days about the difference in those and everybody has their uh, various, uh, you know, kind of uh, analogies of what what's the difference in diversity, equity and inclusion. But really, for us as a company at Go Culture, it's about how we as individuals improve our skills and just how we how we treat other people. That's what it really comes down to. So and I know I know you'll ask some great questions a little more about that. But to me, that's what DEI is about. Wonderful. Yeah. How we treat other people. What a concept. Right. <laughs> so it all matters and, and we're all interacting with each other. And so um, yeah, that does go into the next question of, of why is this such a relevant topic right now? Yeah, there seems to be uh, this greater awareness now and uh, willingness to address these issues that for you and for me and, and for a lot of people have been important always. But for, you know, typically, in, in, at least in the U.S., we tend to, the market follows media and media has been focused more primarily on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so that has allowed individuals in this field to have more of a voice and to be able to stand up and say, hey, that we need to be doing more at our workplace and to find more support. So we're seeing that across the board. And that's an exciting, exciting time. The, these moments have come in history. They last for a little while and they go away. But what we're seeing now is, is a more purposeful, long lasting trend. And, and, and again, enhancing the way we treat we treat each other. Um, that's great. I guess. Um... I have my own ideas on why that why that might be happening over time, but it is amazing, I think, how we come together as a culture to find solutions, right, where there are particular breakdowns, um, and now we're seeing it in the workplace. Um, so, and um, so thank you for, for sharing why it's a relevant topic, and that's interesting about media um, as well. But um, I think the audience would also like to know why are you a qualified person or an expert in DEI? If you could give us just a little background. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You know, I, you can ask my wife. I, I don't think I'm an expert at anything. <laughs> not, not even not even taking the trash out, Haley. But but uh, <laughs> you know, in this this is something. This is an area that that both I and and the gentleman who founded this this project with me. He is in his early 80s now, and we he's, he dedicated 47 years to researching this area. I jumped in with him. Uh, I was a university professor. My doctorate is in intercultural communication. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I joined him for the last 20 years of his research in this area. So we've been we've been looking at this extensively 
uh, over and over and over again. Uh, really, I know I throw a lot of numbers out, but over the last 20 years, specifically targeted around this idea of human interaction uh, mm -hmm. among diversity. I know mean, you might call it cross-cultural interaction. Some of us do that really well. Some of us really struggle. Why? How can we do better at that? And so, uh, you know, we, we've done we've done these studies and uh, with thousands of folks re representing work in over 40 different countries. So it's been it's been quite a journey. But um, if if that if that qualifies me, I, I hope it does uh, to be able to at least <laughs> do a little bit, at least at least step into a little bit. You know, I don't have all the answers by any means, but to to help out where we can. Um. Well, thank you for that. And I don't think any of us have all of the answers, but definitely dedicating 20 years of your life to understanding it and being able to share that is, um, you know, I think would qualify as an expert. So, hey, um, yeah, and I love um, how you said human interaction, um, because when I think of DEI, it, it does become deduced down to particular um people groups. Um, I think that's how it's usually positioned. And that actually makes the conversation even less human, right? So human interaction. Um, I love that. So, um, and then I, I think the next thing I'd like to ask before we get into the meat of the conversation is, um, what does Go Culture do? What does your company do? Yeah, Go Culture is an online offering that provides organizations the ability to reach across the entire enterprise organization, every single employee, and do evaluation. To date, diversity, equity, inclusion, primarily diversity data, <clears throat> excuse me, data has been around talent acquisition demographic spread. So how many people who fit into this box did we hire last quarter? And, and that's helpful. It's important to be hiring diverse uh, candidates and things, but really what we're able to do is move past that or beyond that or further than that and be able to say, okay, we have 100,000 employees. What are these aptitudes that each of these employees holds? And then if we know uh, these 15 aptitudes or maybe call them indicators of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, attitudes and behaviors, then we can in fact do uh, training around those things all through you know, mobile delivery. So that's what we do. We, we help organizations with, with measurement and with certification okay. in diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, it's very important when you're, when you're able to measure, um, measure real you know, benchmarks, um, as you said, performance and growth, because um, I think we're all looking for growth um, personally, professionally in our culture. So um, well, let's get into um, one of those 15 indicators of DEI attitudes and attributes, right? Attitudes and beliefs. So the first one that we have is um, navigating uncertainty. And I think this is like, a, um, yeah, it hits home for everyone, everyone right now. Um, <laughs> so and it definitely speaks outside of, of what people look like, right? So I, yeah. I can't wait to hear what you have to share about, um, like why, why is this an indicator and what does that look like? How is that tested and measured? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Haley. So <clears throat> what we found, kind of give a little background on that. We, you know, over the 20 years, we, we found that there were about 15, we had about 16 for a while, we were able to kind of uh, smash a couple of these together, but these key indicators around individual aptitudes and diversity, equity, inclusion, these 15 top indicators. And, and there are things that, you know, that we go through these lists that, that a lot of people would say, well, I've never seen that evaluated before. Or I wouldn't have thought that was a part mm -hmm. of it, but you know, we have to look at these things and say, well, the research has pointed us here and we've tested this over and over again. This seems to get us mm -hmm. our most reliable data. And so this is what we're going with. And, you know, navigating uncertainty is, is really uh, at its heart, you know, comes down to, you know, it, each of us have a kind of developed, you might call it innate, you might call it developed uh, threshold of how we handle ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And that's really what this is about, because if you are, 
if you are um, going to do do much better and, and get better at we call this you know um, uh, interpersonal interaction we were talking about a while ago cross culturally with anybody who seems different you perceive a difference between you and somebody else if we're going to get better at that we've got to be able to step in to a situation where we don't know really what will happen with somebody we do not know and be able to kind of roll with that and then find ways to reduce uh, some anxiety that, that's caused around around that situation so navigating uncertainty yeah is, is a way for us to measure our, our level of call it anxiety around those types of things and once we know that then we can begin to prepare somebody okay what are some things we can be doing to help you get more prepared Great. And so um, can you walk us through what, um, how you start measuring that, like in your, in the, in the program, are there particular questions? Um, what are some examples of questions that you would ask to, to see how, um, like maybe measure levels of anxiety? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a great question. So with the areas actually, you know, we measure, every single person who steps into our platform. And we believe that is important for a handful of reasons, but one of the primary reasons is because it's important for us to have <clears throat> some self-realization. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if, if I have, I'm not going to work to improve on anything unless you help me understand that I need to improve there. So if, if I'm a, you know, 15 year old uh, kid who plays basketball in my backyard and I want to go out for the team. I feel like I'm pretty good until I try out for the team and realize, well, my dribbling skills or my or my passing skills are not as good as I thought they were. I need to get better at that to be on the team. So similarly, even even our attitudes and behaviors around diversity, equity, inclusion, a lot of us don't don't realize we have some gaps here that we could really do some improving work on. And so it's, I think it's part of what we bring to the table is the ability to say, hey, Haley, you're, you know, you're a great person and, and, and you're doing some things really well here. Had you ever thought about this idea of navigating uncertainty? So through a questionnaire that we have tested over these 20 years, we're able to give you some data around uh, your ability to navigate uncertainty. So, for example, uh, uh, the uh, average or normalized score around navigating uncertainty is somewhere around 80 percent so okay. if you don't get 100 percent doesn't mean that, <laughs> that you just, just bombed the thing it's it, it, but we're able to see okay as a rule people are in this 80 percent range so if i'm above that i'm doing you know a little more than average or below or right at and then um, and then you're able to kind of have this again self-realization well i'm doing pretty well at that i'm going to focus on another area or or not so this but the data that we're providing haley uh, brings uh, with it after years of testing what's called uh, cromback alpha score and the cromback alpha score uh, it really comes down to your data reliability and mm -hmm. typically data around areas like this at all or or at best around a 43% reliable and so you think about uh flipping a coin and if you were to mm -hmm. flip a coin and give someone a questionnaire about their dei aptitudes and flip a coin you're more likely to get accurate results flipping a coin and so over the years if you do this correctly you can eventually get your evaluation to give you data reliability and in, up into the 70 percent range and that's that's really 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 hard and it's really really good that's kind of the, the gold standard uh area but after doing this for 20 years uh, haley we, we're, we're spitting out data that is 93 percent reliable yeah that's really incredible uh and um in that data how what how large is that is that data group are the, the cohorts in that data how about how many pieces of data do you have yeah, it's not it's not yet in the millions. Uh, it's in the thousands. I mean, it's I have to look back. I don't want to give you a false number. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, you know, during during these twenty years, uh, we it was important for us to 
step outside uh, of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Because to really fully understand human interaction, we've got to move beyond kind of a U.S. centric model. And so we mm -hmm. you know, it was just over 40. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't 50, but it was just over 40 uh, countries where we've been doing this work. Okay. And um, is that just because the, the U.S., like, we're so large and there's less opportunity um, for that, that, that cross-cultural interaction? Or why, why moving out of the U.S. to conduct this, the majority of this research? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, we actually, one of the ways and reasons we did that is because one of the best ways to evaluate an individual's ability to engage with diverse others is, is by putting them in a kind of a high stress situation uh, <laughs> that, that requires them to interact and to see how they do. So what we would do a lot of times, Haley, is we would take groups of individuals and uh, do evaluation and training with them. And then they would go out and spend it could be anywhere from a number of weeks to a number of years doing li living in other countries. And they, okay. and you talk about, um, and I, I know you've moved across the country a time or two. And, and so, and, and you start this new life and you meet new people and make friends. And, and, and that is a great snapshot for researchers to watch and mm -hmm. to watch that moment. How does Haley do when she moves from Texas to California? How does she how does she interact with new people, with new ideas and new ways of life? And they may they may look like you. They may not look like you. They may speak like you. They may not. They may eat different foods, whatever, whatever the difference is. We how we how we not only handle that, but handle that in a high stress situation, which is any kind of any time we relocate. So that's one mm -hmm. of the ways we were able to reach out to so many different countries and study in so many different cultures what we were doing. Um, that's interesting. Well, I think um, I have a really funny story. When I first moved to LA, I mean, you know that I'm adopted and I think um, a lot of my audience knows that I'm adopted, um, but I had never had sushi. <laughs> like I never had sushi. And so I was 20, just turned 22 years old, coming to California I walk into a Trader Joe's and I'm like, wow, this is like the coolest grocery store ever. And I'm like, whoa, there's sushi, there's California rolls. <laughs> so I buy these California rolls, feeling all cool and trying something new. And I come across this little packet of green stuff. And I'm like, this is interesting. You know, maybe it's guacamole. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, like like a good West okay. Texas girl. <laughs> like, and I was like, well, you know. This is California. That's a California roll. There's avocado in here, so I, it's probably guacamole. So I take it and I spread it all over one of the oh, pieces no. and I ate it. And I was like, "Whoa, that is not guacamole." But um, <laughs> so I learned. I learned never to do that again and to ask, um, "What is this stuff?" <laughs> and how do I actually eat it? <laughs> so not not many uh, sushi restaurants in West Texas. No, but a lot of Mexican <laughs> restaurants with fabulous guacamole. <laughs> 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 so that's uh, one of my favorite, like, really funny stories. But um, yeah, I guess in in um, as far as navigating uncertainty, I was like, well, I I'm just gonna try it. Let's see what happens. Let's try it. Learn from it. And if I if I don't know what it is, or I didn't. Uh, it wasn't a pleasurable experience. Let me figure out how to, who to ask, um, more qualified <laughs> people yeah. to ask to be able um, to know how to handle this green packet in a California roll situation better yeah. next time. <laughs> and that's, that's, a, that's a great lighthearted example, you know, of, of kind of what we, we have to make decisions when we are, Faced with interacting with diversity, you know, we we can either it's kind of the fight or flight. You know, you can say I'm just not certain how this is going to go, and so I'm just going to avoid it all that I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that uncertainty oh, yeah. can can really uh, inhibit our ability to 
develop, to initiate and develop these really, really rich relationships. Mm -hmm. There's this, uh, this concept that I know, Haley, you know, this uh, of being in the field of, of communication uh, through education is, it's called uncertainty reduction. I used to teach this all the time and I always had to laugh because it's really lame name because it kind of just says what it is. I mean, we, we all have the desire when we meet somebody for the first time, there's this incredible level of uncertainty. And, mm -hmm. and that is what drives us. Some of us, it can drive you away. So I just don't know about that person. I'm not interested. I, I'm not, my personality maybe is not to ask questions or whatever, but but mm -hmm. others on the other end of the spectrum like you Haley right would say well, I'm going to ask 45 questions here in three minutes and I'm going to get a ton of information a because I'm interested b I wanted to build a relationship but c being this idea that that uncertainty causes me a level of angst and, and I would really mm -hmm. feel better if I just knew more about you and that hap that that doesn't matter if it's yeah. your neighbor next door or or whether it's uh, somebody you're meeting for the first time. You think back to uh, your your dating days, you know, Haley. I mean, you know, meeting a guy and and then you know, there's this process of asking questions, and you're reducing that anxiety by reducing the uncertainty about that person. And so we have the same thing that happens all the time cross culturally with human interaction, and we need to reduce okay. that. And one way to do that is to simply engage and ask questions. Try to avoid that urge to just run away. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, um, as you're saying, being in a new situation, um, I think something that, you know, I, I personally experience um, in, you know, within my within my family life, um, a long, long time of friends and family, um, and I would even say in industry, too, where we've reached this comfort place but there's still we still have uncertainty and um, I think from my experience the best way to navigate that uncertainty for me is sometimes to avoid like well I think I already know what's going to happen here based on my experience mm -hmm. this is going to be the response so I'm not going to ask questions I'm just going to take a back seat to um, what I what I my experience has proven. Can you speak to that a little bit um, as we as we're exposed to the same experiences over and over again, whether that might be like within family members, friends, um, professionals or other people groups, when we start building up this this experience knowledge bank, how do we then how are, are we then able to continue, you know, the cycle over again to navigate the uncertainty of like maybe what we know? Does that, does that question even make sense? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. It does to me. Now, whether 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 the what I understand you're asking and what you're asking are the same, I have no idea. <laughs> but but uh, I think I think what you're what you're asking is is I mean I know it's really important, but I think what you're asking is how do we break this kind of mental emotional cycle that has been affirmed over the years in our lives uh, and and that w w with various other people and and so that's a great question what psychologically there's a lot going on here and that in that process you know ju just like when you uh, uh, when you buy a car and you have what's called um, you know uh, buyer's remorse uh, the term for this is actually called a cognitive dissonance we are looking for, as soon as you do that and you think oh man what did i do buying that car you're looking for affirmation that you did the right thing and so you're looking for things that tell you so hey i read online they get great fuel mileage hey i'm supposed to be really safe and i feel better and better about that we do the same thing but maybe in an opposite way and sometimes social interaction. So especially, and we'll talk probably later on some other day about our family's impact on us and how they how they shape who we are in these ways. But if I if my life experience has taught me, and I mean really taught me, I mean I, I've been exposed somewhat uh, to, to to various others. Then 
and, and every experience is, I think, I think it was negative. Well then, yeah, you're going to think, okay, well, everybody who is the, in this group, in my mind, I, I just want to stay away. But what we're doing mm -hmm. is similar to when we bought the car, is if that's what I think I need to believe, we're looking for ways, we're looking for ways that affirm, things that affirm that belief. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if, if it is something in the news that was maybe negative or scary or whatever, about, or whatever, you know, I, well, I've had the bad interaction with someone who was like that before, who looked like that, or was from this area, or whatever, or had, had this religious belief, or I uh, thought thought a, a certain way about sexual identity and things like that. That, if, if you if you want to, you can allow yourself to reaffirm those things by all these things that you see. So I think that mm -hmm. that is part of what takes place there. I think part of that part of the trick is is stepping back and realizing. Okay, every time I interact with somebody, fill in the blank, whoever this may be for, for an individual, I get upset, I get frustrated at this, that. Is that because that situation every single time is frustrating? You know, or, or am I just telling myself, kind of repeating this cycle in my mind psychologically? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm re gonna reaffirm for myself that now that's why I don't interact with that person. And I think the, but the second piece of that, Haley, I think is, uh, you're gonna hear me probably say numerous times uh, that media plays a significant role in how we perceive each other. Mm -hmm. I was speaking with a, a professional a couple weeks back in the uh, Portland area. We all saw Portland in the news, Portland was burning, mm -hmm. all these race riots and things like that. So, and I think there were places where it was quite, quite severe and, and it's, but, but she said, look, I, I have friends who live downtown and when the news was showing you pictures and videos of these streets being demolished, so my friends would go outside with their phone and show me that, look, no one's out here, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I'm not saying that media is just always lying to us or anything like that, but I, but I do think media plays a big role in helping, I say helping, and it hurts the way we think about each other. Mm. Because the media runs a business model. Business model is if we can create fear, hate, anxiety between groups of people, now we're mm. making some money because we're selling, we're selling things, right? And so mm. we have that in mind that that and that reaffirms in our mind just like that cycle does that I should fear hate you know have anxiety mm -hmm. I, I want to be around certain kinds of people um gosh I I'm excited to get into our next our next sessions <laughs> our next fab Fridays to unpack some of these these other indicators um that you know maybe I think that you touched on unconscious bias as you said family uh, family experience or family impact. So um, thank you so much, Justin, for coming on again today and being our DEI partner. Um, really looking forward to continually talking about the other factors. So um, yeah, we'll make it a great day. Thank you all for joining us. And um, we'll have Justin's information down in the links, um, down in the, in the descriptions, uh, whether you're watching the video, um, listening to the podcast. So um, thank you all so much. Have a fabulous Friday and thank make you, a great Ailey. day. Okay. Bye.